Okay, so I think it's time to get the show on the road. Thanks for showing up to learn a little bit about testing. Today's topic is, of course, JUnit 5 and new opportunities for testing on the JVM. My name is uh, Sam Brannan. I'm a Spring and Java consultant at a company called SwiftMine in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, trainer, coach, etc., but a hard code developer at heart. And I've been a Java developer for about 20 years, a uh, core Spring framework committer since 2007, which when I originally um, rewrote Spring's testing support, uh, the whole annotation-based stuff, support for testing GDJ and 4, et cetera. And I've been a core committer for um, J5 since October 2015. <clears throat> so SwiftMind, experts in Spring and, and Java. Um, you can find us online if you want some consulting on how to use J5 better, perhaps Spring, et cetera. So the agenda, first I'll talk about um, impetus for change, like why we did it. Um, then I'll talk about J5 in detail, a little bit about Spring 5, and then uh, time permitting uh, Q&A, though. Uh, if you're unhappy with the uh, 45 minute format, as I've heard other speakers say, then feel free to complain. It would be nice if, if we had an hour. Unfortunately, we gotta rush it through for 45 minutes, but um, no fear. We have a boff tonight on, on JNU5, so if there are more questions and stuff like that, if you wanna see me um, live code some more stuff, or answer some more questions, then please come to the, to the boff as well. That would be great. So uh, first up, show of hands, uh, who writes tests? All right. <laughs> who uses uh, JUnit, anyone? Most, okay, anyone use anything other than JUnit? Yes, test and G, maybe 2%, uh, Spock, something like that. A few more, any kind of other like Scala tests or anything else? I don't know, one guy, okay. So everyone, Java, Java. JUnit, uh, I didn't ask the version, JUnit 4, I suppose, right? Anyone still using JUnit 3? Oh, you sorry, sorry souls, <laughs> more souls, well. <clears throat> we've, got, we've got you covered, actually. So uh, why do we have a new version of JUnit? Um, if you're experienced with JUnit, uh, and you've tried to implement stuff on your own, you, you might know some of the reasons. Um, <clears throat> but just a brief overview for those who don't know. So JNIT 4 was released over a decade ago. Um, a lot has changed since then. Our testing needs as a community have matured, um, and our expectations have grown for what we expect from our framework. So I often say JUnit is a horrible name because it has the word unit baked into it, and people think it's only about unit testing, but obviously that's not the case anymore, right? Integration testing, system testing, intent testing, all sorts of stuff. Another thing with JUnit 4, um, in terms of modularity, there really um, wasn't much, right? Kind of a big ball of mud. There was only the JUnit jar, right? And dis um, test discovery and execution, those um, issues were tightly coupled. Extensibility, a um, lot of room for improvement there, and we hopefully have achieved that. And last but not least, let's not forget about modern versions of the JVM, right? So we have Java 8 and even uh, Java 9, and of course, JUnit 4 only theoretically supports Java 5, so to speak in terms of the API. So <clears throat> in JUnit 4, there's this main concept of a runner, um, runner API. It's very powerful. In fact, you can do anything, you can do anything with it, um, but you can't combine runners. So for example, if you ever try to use the parameterized runner from JUnit and the spring runner from spring, it's a no-go, doesn't work, right? So then the next slide we have here is a bit of a, a joke. So um, you might think JUnit 4 rules, like super cool, or you might read it as rules are meant to be broken, and I would say JUnit 4 rules are meant to be broken, and in fact, always were, unfortunately. Um, so in JUnit 4.7, there was this method rule. You can annotate something with that rule and have that registered. And then they came up with an idea for class level support um, with the test rule in JUnit 4.9. Um, you could have it at the um, kind of like the method level or the class level. And that's great for simple use cases. Um, they can even be combined, which is, which is nice. Um, but a single rule can't be used for both method level and class level callbacks. Um, plus there's zero support for what I um, call instance level callbacks. So case in point, if you've ever used spring support with rules, um, I had to implement this as, as two rules, unfortunately. So it's pretty ugly boilerplate code. You have to say you want the spring class rule and the spring method rule where you really just want to say, I just want spring, right? So what happened? <clears throat> How did this all come about that we got to JNIT 5? First, we had um, a crowdfunding campaign called uh, JNIT Lambda. Um, Pivotal listed here as one of the main sponsors there, um, initiated by some, some German guys, um, previous committers on JNIT 4, joined by some other German guys and, and me, yours truly. Um, we all happen to speak German, which is just kind of a coincidence. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just because Germans like to test. <laughs> Perhaps, I don't know. And our, our latest committer is also from Germany. So um, yeah, we need some people from like the States and, and other countries maybe. Um, anyway, so this uh, ran from July to October 2015, raised a fair amount of money. Um, and four companies donated, donated six weeks of um, full-time developer time, including uh, Pivotal, to, who also in, um, contributed more. So Pivotal, not just Spring, also supporting the, the JUnit 5 initiative. So if, if your name's up here, 
or your company, then thank you very much for helping us get started. What that helps us do, it helps us have a kickoff meeting. We had some big names in the community, um, developer from Gradle, um, IntelliJ and Eclipse, uh, as well as these core committers um, coming together. Uh, we started off and kicked off Jane 5. So first off, we had a prototype we did back, um, released in December um, 2015. Then we had an alpha um, a few months later, and then um, huge, uh, big step to the M1, a couple of milestones in between over a course of a year, a um, couple of release candidates, I say two to three because the first one was kind of snafu, didn't really exist, so we really had two that you could use. Um, and then 5.0 GA, so hopefully you, you heard about that, September 10th, 2017, and as of today, a few hours ago, uh, we released 5.0.1, so with a few small bug fixes um, in case you're already on, on 5.0. So that's where we are. <clears throat> Jane 5 in a nutshell, it's modular, right? So we have lots of modules, you'll see that. Um, it's very extensible, and uh, we like to think it's modern, right? It's at least running on Java 8 and has some, some modern features like Lambda expressions and stuff like that. Um, another really uh, crucial thing that we um, put a lot of consideration to is, is compatibility, being both forward and backward compatible at the same time. So what that means is that the JUnit platform, which I'll talk about in a minute, that supports um, JUnit 3.8 and, and at the same time as what we would call JUnit 5 or the new Jupyter programming model. Um, in addition, new testing frameworks that are based on the platform can be run with uh, JUnit 4 infrastructures. That means you can use your old IDEs and your old build tools if you want to, but we'll see we're getting support for build tools and IDEs along the way. So the way this is done, if you're familiar with JUnit, have um, a particular runner for the platform called JUnit Platform. So you just say at run with JUnit Platform, you can run that in an old version of Eclipse, old version of NetBeans, IntelliJ, et cetera. So in terms of um, version support, obviously Java 8, right? Otherwise it wouldn't be modern. Um, that's, that's the baseline, right? So it's all compiled against Java 8 using Lambda expressions and stuff like that. Um, but you can, of course, use it to test application code compiled against the previous version, right? A different um, target version. Java 9 version um, also supported, right? You might have seen in, in the keynote, um, Mark had all those open source projects listed up there, and um, JNet 5 is, in fact, one of them works fine on JDK 9. Um, and in fact, uh, each of the artifacts has a stable automatic module name already in it, so you can already use it on the module path if you choose to. And um, we'll support for uh, scanning the module path for your test classes and stuff like that um, in 5.1, that's the plan. So right now we have um, class path scanning support, and we'll add module path scanning support as well. So this, this is very key, I'll say this a few times. Um, there is no spoon, right? Okay, there is no JUnit 5. You can't say, I have JUnit 4 and change the version to 5. It's not going to work because we actually rewrote everything. And we actually, in the process, ended up inventing uh, three kind of projects together. We didn't realize it at the start, but after a while we realized it and split it up, and we gave them names. So we have the JUnit platform released at version 1.0. That's the foundation for launching a testing framework on the JVM. And I say any testing framework. It doesn't mean it has to be in Java. It doesn't mean it has to be from the JUnit team. It could be Scala, Groovy, Kotlin, whatever. You can run your own. Um, so for that, we have what are known as the launcher and test engine APIs. <clears throat> we have um, built-in console launcher, um, built-in support for Gradle and Maven. And then the next part is what you might actually consider to be JUnit 5. It's the new programming model and extension model that you'll be using mainly if you're, you're focusing on, on JUnits, right? So this is called JUnit Jupiter. A lot of people ask, why Jupiter? Um, what's the fifth planet from the sun? Anyone know? So Jupiter. It happens to also start with JU, like JUnit, so that's kind of cool too. All right, <laughs> you could say JUnit Jupiter if you want to pronounce it like that. Okay, so next part, um, we tossed around some ideas. I want to call it legacy, um, but people, uh, we thought maybe people would feel insulted, so I said maybe, maybe retro. Uh, we ended up deciding so vintage is a support for what came before, and that means uh, we have a test engine that will support um, running JUnit 3 if you're so unfortunate. Um, but also JUnit 4 at the same time. And actually, we didn't aim to support JUnit 3. It just happens to be that JUnit 4 supports JUnit 3, so we couldn't not support JUnit 3 in that regard. So, so it is. Um, and then some, some points here, very important. <clears throat> so the first part is, is revolutionary, right? This has never really existed before. The platform really is a new platform to write any kind of testing framework that runs on the JVM, and everyone can benefit from, from that. You can play on testing frameworks and stuff like that. Um, the next one is evolutionary, right? So there was JUnit 4, and now there's this JUnit Jupiter, kind of JUnit 5, um, but similar programming models, just, just kind of evolutionary. And the last part, I would say, is necessary um, just to support existing uh, testing code bases. So <clears throat> this Launcher API, um, like JUnit Core and JUnit 4, if you're familiar with that, it's used by um, IDEs and tools to launch the framework, so you wouldn't uh, probably use it yourself, but you could if you wanted to play around with it. 
and it's a Sentry API for discovering and executing tests via one or more um, registered test engines. And for that, there's what's known as a launcher discovery request. Um, has support for what we call selectors and filters. Selectors, you can select things like um, select this uh, to, from the class path, this class path route. You can select um, packages to scan. You can select tests uh, classes, for example. You can also select individual test methods, these kind of things. And filtering, you can filter based on like um, uh, test engine IDs or um, filter based on class names like that, you know, like a pattern for the class or tags and stuff like that. So a lot of features actually aren't supported yet in the IDE, but we think that will come with time. <clears throat> in terms of getting feedback, if you want to have your own um, tie into the, the reporting infrastructure, you could implement a test execution listener um, and get, get feedback on all the events that are occurring as the test plan executes. And then again, this console launcher allows you to actually run um, a test suite from the, the console if you wanted to, or run it from a Java main or something else like that. So test engine API, um, you might consider this somewhat analogous to the, the runner API from JNet 4, except that the test engine API is, is generic and not limited to Java per se. So a test engine discovers and executes tests, key here, for a particular programming model. And um, these things can be automatically registered um, with the Java service loader mechanism. So as long as they have the right information there in the jar uh, and they're on the class path and they get automatically registered, which is cool, right? And for uh, JN Jupyter, we have a Jupyter test engine. Vint vintage, we have one as well. And you can implement your own, which people have actually done. So this is taken straight from this uh, page. We have a wiki page where we allow people to um, publish or post um, third-party extensions they've written for uh, the JNet platform or JNet Jupyter. And we can see um, there are at least five that I know of um, existing test engines outside of the two I mentioned that come from the JNet team itself. So for example, like this uh, Spexy one at the top, some guy wrote his own little testing framework based on closures and stuff like that, and it works in Scala, Java, and Groovy. Um, the spec one is for Kotlin, and yeah, you can check out the others if you want as well. So here's the, the big picture, because people like big pictures, right? So here we have the platform in the middle, right? As I mentioned before, the IDEs and build tools, we use that. And what you do, you're up at the top, you're going to write in your old tests, JNet4, stuff like that. It will use the vintage infrastructure. If you're using uh, JNet Jupyter, you're using that infrastructure, or one of these third-party test engines, like I mentioned on the previous slide, or if you write your own. <clears throat> and then everything else is the platform in the middle. So if you look behind the scenes there, we'll see the old test is just using uh, JNet412. Right? And we have this JNet Vintage engine that knows how to adapt from JNet4 to the platform um, test engine API. And then we have the new stuff, the Jupyter API. That's what you code against, and the engine is what supports it. And then every other third party would have their own API and their own engine implementation as well. And then, and then internally, right? so the IDEs, they're going to work with this, this launcher, and we have different things that run that. So that runner I talked about for JNet4, that's in there. We got the Surefire support, the Gradle support, and the console launcher all talking to the same API. So this is what I'm saying, that it's uh, new opportunities for the JVM. And if we talk about JUnit 5, if we were to focus on that, right, that's just, just this little green part up here. And everything else is more like the platform, right? And anyone else can implement their own stuff. So that's why I say it's a, it's a game changer. So in terms of IDE and build support, IntelliJ has been supporting us for quite a long time. So um, as I mentioned, we have one of the core developers that came to our kickoff meeting, and we've been communicating with her ever since then. So ever since IDEA. 2016.2 um, uh, and above. They've had support, and they have support for a GA recently as well. Eclipse joined the, um, the game a little bit later, but they have actually very good support. Um, Eclipse Oxygen 4.7.1a is supposed to be released next week on the uh, 11th, I think, or something like that. And it's actually, I'm using the release candidate one for that in the demos today. Um, NetBeans, I think the, the monkeys tell the story. I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> Gradle. Uh, we have um, an interim solution from the JNet team we've written ourselves. We are not experts in Gradle. We're in writing Gradle plugins. We wrote one, and it works. And we use it ourselves. And uh, the Gradle team is going to be taking that over, uh, time permitting, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, they, they've claimed recently on the issue tracker. Um, there's also uh, third-party support for Android that a nice gentleman from the community has written. So you can check that out if you need to work with JNet5 and Android. Maven, um, we also have an interim solution there uh, that we've used and implemented. And that's currently being taken over by the Maven Surefire team. So we donated the code that we have, and they're taking it forward from there. That's the idea. <clears throat> Ant, we have no Ant support. But we have an open issue with grabs. If you want to implement it, feel free. Um, in terms of how to set this stuff up, I'm not going to have time to show it today. So if you want to see how, uh, just check out the user guide for documentation. We also have some sample, sample apps that show you how to get Gradle and, and Maven up and running with the platform itself and with JNet Jupyter or with JNet Vintage as well. So, 
Now we're going to jump into Jane. I'm going to give you an overview of the extension model, and if you have more questions, we can talk about that uh, during the BOF tonight. So we have an extension that's a marker interface. The org JNIT Jupyter API extension packages are different from what we had in, in JNIT 4, right? So there weren't any conflicts. That was also a design decision there. And yep, yeah. implement as many as you like, right? So I said you couldn't combine rules or you couldn't have a class level and a method level rule in JNIT 4. Um, in JNIT Jupyter, you can uh, combine them as, as you wish. And the way you register one of those, instead of run with in JNIT 4, you at extend with. And then you specify one or more extensions to be registered at the class level, method level, or the first word there, even on interfaces, right? So that's kind of cool. Even on interface default methods and stuff like that as well. So, or, right, okay, who's ever used Spring, anyone? Yep, and you know, meta annotation support, cool annotation support. So in um, JN5, I put really hard to convince the team that, so we support it's a meta annotation. Is this working well? Yeah. Cutting out. Anything? Am I doing something wrong? No. Flailing. I'll stop flailing. <laughs> <laughs> Extension APIs. So here we have um, before all, before each. Uh, we have befores and afters for various levels. So all is a class level that would be like before class. Um, before each would be like kind of before in JN4. And before test execution, this is immediately before the test method is executed or immediately afterwards. And these are what's known as lifecycle callbacks. But these are the extensions, right? So the extensions map on to the user extension points as well. Um, beyond that, we have something that comes kind of in the middle there. Right after the method's executed, there is a test execution exception handler, which allows you to handle exceptions if you wanted to implement something like an expected exception or logging exceptions and stuff like that. Um, another thing we have is called execution condition. Talk about it more in detail uh, a little bit. Test instance post processor and parameter resolver. Very cool. And this is the support for dependency injection in JUnit Jupyter, so much better than what we had in JUnit 4. And the last one, a bit more complex, but we have a test template invocation context provider, and that's for doing cool stuff like uh, repeated tests, parameterized tests, test matrices, and stuff like that. So uh, now the programming model, what you'll use the most, all these things are located in the org JUnit Jupyter API package, so they're not in org JUnit, right? Don't get confused and pick the wrong test annotation. And if you're using the, uh, the parameter support, that's in a params package. If you're using the uh, JUnit 4 migration support, we'll see later, that's also in a different package. M most of the stuff is in this API package. <clears throat> so, Worldwind feature set. We support uh, annotations and support those an meta annotations. Uh, we have assertions and assumptions, custom display names, uh, visibility, not everything has to be public anymore, so you can type less. Uh, we have built-in support for tagging, uh, conditional test execution, dependency injection, both for constructors and methods. Uh, we support lambda expressions and method references in various places, uh, for example, in assertions and stuff like that. We allow you to uh, use default methods, Java 8, things like that. New uh, nested test class support, and then also repeated tests, parameterized tests, and dynamic tests. So in terms of annotations, uh, these are the main ones. At test, we couldn't come up with a better name, so we left it the same. Uh, for dynamic tests, we, we have test factory, and in gray here is at testable. So if you're writing a test engine, you would actually want to use that annotation. Um, next up, variations of, of tests. So we have repeated tests and parameterized tests, and these are specializations of what's known as a test template, as I mentioned previously before. Um, nested test classes um, at test instance. So uh, I'm going to make a statement, and we can see who actually knows this. So in JUnit uh, 1 through 4, JUnit always re-instantiates your test class between every test method. Who knew that? So maybe 10%, right? And in test in G, it's the exact opposite. It keeps your test instance the entire time. So um, I've often been a fan of the way test and G does it. And uh, I had this in the prototype and then got voted out, but I got it voted back in and re-implemented it for GA. So in JUnit uh, Jupyter, you can pick the model you want. You can say, I want to have test instance per class or per method. And uh, one of the reasons that I was able to convince the team is because it's actually a prerequisite for supporting things like scenario tests, which we want to um, support in a later release. So uh, we have before all, after all, that's like before class and after class. Before each and after each, that's like before and after. Display name, that's for custom display name. Tags, that kind of replaces categories from JNIT4. And at disabled, replaces at ignore. People say, why didn't you keep it? Well, it'll make more sense when I talk about the execution stuff in a bit. But basically, um, I couldn't come up with an opposite of ignore. Because um, we do not ignore, it is not ignored. Uh, and it makes more sense to say a test is either enabled or disabled. And, and that um, comes through in the API we'll see later on. So <clears throat> if you want to migrate, um, we have some experimental limited support for a few of the rule types for JNIT4. 
Um, you can, uh, this is kind of like Spring Boot, but it's not. Uh, at enable rule migration support. So if you annotate a class with that, um, you get three extensions on the fly. External resource support, which is support for like temporary folder in Janet 4. Uh, verifier support, things like error collectors in Janet 4. And expected exception support for, well, expected exception, right? So you can actually use these kind of rules um, with Janet Jupyter because they map onto the, um, the new uh, extension API that we have. Yes, and there was a minor bug, but it got released and fixed today in 501. So uh, assertions, um, yep, we have a limited core set. Um, I copied some of the basics from JNIT4, and then we reworked some stuff and expanded everything. So we've still got stuff like assert equals assert not null, et cetera. But every time you see a green lambda, can, is that even green? I don't know. These little lambda things. That means you can use a lambda expression or a method reference with JNIT and Jupyter. So assert throws is the cool new way to do expected exceptions. Assert timeout and assert timeout, timeout preemptively. Uh, those are ways to uh, assert timeouts, like you might have had a timeout rule previously. Um, the difference is timeout will um, execute it in the same thread and then stop after the test stops and tell you whether or not it finished in time. Assert timeout preemptively will run your code in a new thread and it'll kill it early preemptively, right, if it needs to. Um, a note on that is uh, if you're using something like a framework like Spring that has transactional support um, where the transaction context is tied to a thread local for the current thread and you say ex uh, assert timeout preemptively, then Spring's transaction support would be broken. And if you have other frameworks doing similar stuff, you just need to keep that in mind. So again, timeout preemptively will end faster, but it might break your other framework code you're using. Um, assert all, this is what's known as uh, aggregated assertions or um, grouped assertions or something like, um, what are they called? Soft assertions in assert J, right? So you can combine a bunch, bunch together with random expressions and then Jane will report back all the failures instead of having to rerun those tests. Um, another thing to point out is um, the message at the end now, so your message for why it failed, um, since it should be an optional parameter, it comes at the end. And in addition, you can supply your failure message as a sh supplier of string with a lambda expression, which means that if it takes a long time to, to compute it, or maybe a long time, but there's no reason to generate um, error messages if the assertions don't fail, right? So that's why we did that. And if you want more power, we're not forcing you to, to use our, our assertions if you don't want them. Feel free to use assert J, hamcrest, truth, whatever, right? As long as those things are throwing assertion errors, it's gonna work fine with J and Jupyter, and with the platform as well. So assumptions, has anyone ever used those in J and A4? A few people, right? So you can say, I assume this to be true, and otherwise don't execute the rest of the test. <clears throat> so we have a limited set of those taken over from J and A4, and that's for aborting the test mid-flight. It means the test already started, right? Your test method is executing, but you can say, I checked something, and uh, whoops, I don't want to continue, and it won't mark it as failed, it'll just say that it was skipped. Um, otherwise, if you want to actually skip it, the whole thing, and not even start it, then you could implement your own uh, execution condition, as we'll talk about later on. So we have stuff like assume true, assume false, um, that take uh, Booleans or Boolean suppliers, um, suppliers of strings for the messages, et cetera. And we have another thing called um, assuming that, it's kind of a glorified if. Uh, if you have an assumption that passes, then execute this code. Um, otherwise, don't and continue on with execution of the test method. So this is where I hope the demo gods are with me. Right. All right, so we have a wonderful calculator class. It adds, subtracts, multiplies, divides, and calculates Fibonacci. Fibonacci could take a while, hint, maybe timeouts. You could divide by zero here, right? So you could have some kind of errors. The font. Basic text font, edit. 24 is going to be huge, isn't it? Is that better? Yep, OK, cool. And yeah, we have some cats, people, and string utils for calculating palindromes. So we have <clears throat> a test based on JNIT4. It instantiates the calculator subject on your test. It uses the expected exception rule. And the timeout rule from JNIT4 has some assertions. I hope these are the right ones. Yep, they're all from JNIT4 assert. And then for <clears throat> exception testing, right, so it starts off saying none for the expected exception. And then for this particular case, divide by zero says what it type it expects in the message and then does the thing that's supposed to blow up. And for timeouts, I have some stuff commented out here. So you could have done an old school way like that, where you could have done it with the uh, global timeout milliseconds, a thousand, so one second. And then you execute the thing and see if it, it blows up. So let's just run this test and see if it runs. It does, that's not too exciting. What if we were to pick something bigger, like that, right? 
42, then that should hopefully blow up. It does, and it gives us some kind of error, something like test timed out after 1,000 milliseconds. So in JNet4, that does it preemptively. There's no uh, non-preemptive mode for timeouts in, in JNet4. And for the exception, if we expected, or if we didn't, and run that one, then that would blow up with the exception, right? So it threw the exception. <clears throat> and now what we want to do is we want to see how we can achieve the same stuff in JUnit 5. So this is where the demo gods really might not be with me. We'll give it a shot. I'm gonna, ooh, I can type the U big. P-I-T-E-R. Okay, so now we have a new class, right? <clears throat> and what are we going to do? We're going to say get rid of the, the JUnit 4 stuff, except the rules. We'll leave those, those there for a second. All right, so now it's complaining. I'm going to pick the test API annotation from Jane Jupyter, right? I said things don't have to be public. Should be able to delete all that, clean it up a little bit. Now the assertions aren't there. Let me pick one of those from the right package. Is that the right one? It did from a Jane API assertions. So right now. <clears throat> We've just converted the, um, aha, so why is this failing? Anyone pay, paying attention? The message is at the beginning, that's what I was saying, right? No longer at the beginning. So we put them at the end, you do it like that, and if this were some kind of complex thing and you wanted to build it up, well that's easy, just make it a supplier like that. So use a lambda expression and that works nicely. So if we run this now, what's it gonna do? that divide by zero failed, right? We expected that to happen. And I mentioned there's this uh, rule migration support, which supports the expected exception. So if I run it again now, it's still divide by zero. Let's see what's going on here. Uh, what did I do wrong? Chain of five, uh, enable rule migration. Yeah, expected exception none. It should be in here, right here with this expected exception support. Let me give that a shot. Exception none. This is running the XFX, right? Jupyter calculator divided by zero. Is that right? Pardon? Oh, that might have. Yes. It's nice to have a, an audience paying attention. Thank you very much. See that, <coughs> that crap? <coughs> JUnit 4, why does everything have to be public? Yes, so that's, that's right. But let's get rid of that, right? We don't, we don't want to do that. We want to really migrate. So now this thing doesn't exist. Uh, this is the error mess. Well, let's just start like this. Assert throws. And the type is that one. And the thing we want to execute is this. So how do we supply it? Lambda expression. Like that. All right? So far, so good. If we run it now and save, then that works. All right. And what if we want to check the message? Well, that's not too difficult. Uh, equals. How about equals? Expected. Who thinks that's gonna work? Uh, yep, that works. So this is how you, how you do expected exceptions now in JUnit 5, JUnit Jupyter. And the last part to get rid of is this, this timeout thing. So uh, it was 42 when it ended up being longer than we wanted, and the timeout's not supported with this in any way, so we can just delete this. And now if we run this, this should, uh, well, it'll take a little bit of time. We'll see how long it takes. It took over a second, right? So you want to make sure that it doesn't take over a second, right? And the way we do that is timeout of millis, for example, a thousand. So who thinks that's going to work? 
it's going to say, if people can read this, it says execution exceeded timeout of 1,000 milliseconds by 390. So that was the non-preemptive one. It let it run. You can see the whole the entire running time. And what if we wanted to uh, finish that? We do that preemptively. We could just say preemptively, and then we'll stop immediately after a second and give us an error similar to what we saw in JUnit 4. Right? So execution timed out after 1,000 milliseconds. So that was instantaneous. And by, by the way, if you're wondering what this is, this is just Java time duration of milliseconds of seconds and stuff like that. So a nice little kind of fluent API. Yeah. If you do, um, oh, you mean do we kill it properly? Yeah. Maybe. It attempts to. Um, it, it might not do it in all cases if it's a really kind of rampant kind of thing. But we use an executor service, and we, we do get. The question was uh, if it's going to run on forever. With the preemptively one or the non one? The non one, n no. Uh, it, will, uh, it will keep running. It will run ev forever. Yes. So if you know that it's something, so if you want to time it, you know it's going to finish, and you just want to make sure it's not t taking too long, then you could use a normal timeout. If you want to make sure that it's, um, it might have some kind of um, infinite loop, whatever, and you want to avoid that and kill it off, then you want to do it preemptively. But again, the point there is you have to know if your other framework code, like Spring or something, is using thread locals, then that wouldn't work. So you'd have to figure out something. But that's, that's a threading issue you have to, to deal with anyway. So I think that's it for the, the basics on that. OK. All right, so tagging. <clears throat> Moving on, right? So we have um, an at tag annotation you can clear on um, interface, class, or, or method. Um, something like this, at tag fast on a test method, my fast test. And um, by default, all the tags are enabled, so it doesn't actually have any, uh, any input or uh, any impact on, on the running test plan. You'd have to actually specify to include tags or explicitly exclude tags, otherwise the, the tags are, are ignored. So you can come up with custom tags because we support meta annotations, right? Just declare at tag as a meta annotation. So meta annotation means annotation declared on top of another annotation in the source code. So here we have our own annotation named fast, and it is annotated with at tag fast, and it can be used on methods, and it's retained at runtime. So then we could rewrite the previous slide like this, fast test, and you could reuse the fast um, tag across your code base. And if you want to go on one step further, you can compose tags, a very cool feature. Um, very popular in Spring and now possible with, with JUnit. So um, you can declare a tag as a meta annotation with other annotations. They could be other annotations from JUnit, or um, as I do in the Spring testing support, um, I combine Spring annotations and JUnit annotations to really simplify the configuration. So here we, here we see a combination of tag, fast, and test from JUnit Jupyter, and this is a fast test. So then we can just rewrite that last one as at fast test. And you might have integration tests, smoke tests, different kind of things like that. And again, you can also combine this with Spring support for transactional um, SQL scripts and stuff like that. So pretty powerful stuff. Test names. So by default, um, defaults to the class name or the, the method name, as you're familiar with, uh, with things like test and G and, and, and JUnit 4, et cetera. Um, so the character is naturally limited on the Java syntax. But we have at display name, and JUnit Jupyter allows you to have a custom display name. Um, can contain spaces, special characters, and even emoji, yes. So some guy complained on the internet and the Twitter sphere that it was stupid that we have support for emojis. And I had to say, well, we didn't actually aim to support emojis. Um, we wanted to support the first two, special characters and spaces and stuff like that. And then one day I was like, huh, I wonder if we can actually use an emoji in there. That's a character, right? Um, and uh, it works. We didn't aim to, but it works. I'll show you. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, dependency injection. Um, this is where the extension model meets the programming model, as I like to say. So um, we have a parameter resolver extension API. This is somewhat analogous to uh, Spring MVC support for um, argument resolvers and stuff like that. Resolves a parameter, as you might guess, either for a constructor or a method. Um, and not just for test methods and lifecycle methods, um, but also, uh, yeah, for constructors. So you can um, register multiple simultaneously. They compete, um, but only one wins, because they ask if they support it. And use cases, um, stuff like injecting a server URL, a data source if you have connection to a database, um, a Spring application context, for example, um, stuff like that. So, or mocks is another, another popular one. Uh, test info, this out of the box. 
Um, you can inject this into constructor, test before each, et cetera, from Jane and Jupyter, gives you access to the display name, um, tags, class, method, and stuff like that. We have our own parameter resolver registered um, automatically behind the scenes. That's what we say, eating our own, own dog food. That was actually um, design a principle we had for the whole, the whole Jane at Five effort is that if we have um, an extension point or something we want to implement, then we create an extension point for it. We implement it with that, and other people can also implement the same extension point. So see also, um, if you're using repeated tests, you can use um, have repetition info injected. Um, you can have a test reporter injected to uh, create some additional test reporting information. Um, the Makito extension is something we've uh, implemented as a sample, and the Makito team has taken over. Um, I wrote the Spring extension, and that's been released in, in Spring 5. We'll see that, that later on. So next up, live coding, tags, display names, and dependency injection. Um, what do we have here? So. <clears throat> I have a JUnit 5 test, so now I'd like to make this a test. It's a test. I would like to tag it with fast. Now it's a fast test. You could call this slow or normal or doesn't really matter. So now if I just run this, they're both going to run. Two tests run, normal and fast. That's because we didn't specify any tags, right? I said by default everything's included. So if in Eclipse I go to the run configurations and arguments, Eclipse 471A has support for this. You can say include tag fast like that and run, and then we should see, aha, now it only ran one test, which was in fact the fast test, right? So you can com um, do this uh, within Eclipse. I'm not sure if you can do it in IntelliJ yet, um, but you can do this from your, your Gradle build and from your Maven build and also with the, the console launcher. So that stuff works like that. Now, again, I mentioned uh, you might want to create something like fast test. I've already written it for you here. So this has tag, tag fest, uh, fast and test. Can be used on methods, retained at runtime. So I should be able to replace that, get rid of that, rerun the tests, and we see that Again, that one was actually run the fast test. So this is this cool custom annotation combining tag and test. And I mentioned you can also get information like the uh, dependency injection. So you can say, I'd like that. Please give it to me. And just for fun, I'll just print it out. All right, so what kind of, nope, small t. All right, so now if we run that, we should see some stuff at the console. We see the display name was this fast test. Tags, yep, that's there. This is the class that we're running in. Here's the test method that we were in, right? So we get this kind of information. But the display name was, what was that? It was the name of the method with the parameter list. So what if we wanted to have something custom? Display name, fast test with some special characters. Now we see that's included here in the information, but also more importantly here. Fast test, so, right? See that, fast test? Yes, cool. And now, this is where I have to go back and copy from somewhere. You cannot type emoji in Eclipse. I don't know why, but you can copy and paste them in. <laughs> so, what's gonna happen now? This is where I get the biggest applause, I guarantee it. There, it's in the reporting. Right. Woohoo! But you didn't even see it in the display yet. Okay, now that's the cool part, right? Oh, wow. Yep, there it is. And if we even were to run it from the command line, nope, what am I doing? Where am I? This is not the font I had before. I have a Gradle build with the plugin. It's going to output a tree of the results in theory. There it was. And wow, so very, very cool stuff there. Okay, that's what you all came for, emoji. So, yeah, you're welcome. Oh no, I hit F5 at the wrong place. Somewhere, oh my goodness, does that look good? Okay, we saw that stuff. All right, moving on. I got to go fast now. So if you have any more questions and stuff, we'll, we'll cover it in the BOF tonight. So conditional test execution, um, 
I'd like to think this is a, a game changer, right? This is uh, inspired by like the fact that there was ignore in Jane 4, and in um, Spring we had support for um, if profile value, and Spring had support for things like um, conditions and, and profiles and stuff like that. So that, that'd be really cool if that would, um, also exists in Janet. We have an execution addition, uh, condition for that you can implement. Um, at disable is the first one I implemented for that, and there's a disabled condition that actually supports that. You can check out the code for it. Um, and like I said, this is a game changer because uh, it's not only something we do in, in Janet, you can write your own, and people do. And I really think that's going to be a very popular feature. So um, why might you want to do that? Uh, you might want to do it based on the, the current OS, or the current Java version, or the current day, or something like that. Um, different, different ideas, system property, environment variable, these kind of things. You can just write your own conditions and then share that across your code base. And there will be some other projects that are um, implementing stuff like that. I've done some cool support in uh, Spring for that as well. So um, you can deactivate these things if you want to see maybe, ah, maybe our tests are still working or, or working now. They were disabled. Maybe they were broken. Maybe they work now. Um, you can disable that by saying JDN conditions deactivate and the name of the condition or the, the package and a pattern and stuff like that. So you can basically say run all the tests that maybe were broken before, um, cool features like that. So next up, um, default methods. <clears throat> so Java 8, right, introduces the concept of um, test interface, basically, in, in J and Jupyter. So you can have um, basically multiple inheritance and tests, AKA uh, testing traits. Um, you can use a bunch of the annotations in, uh, on default methods, like before all and after all, but caveat here, only if you're using this at test instance lifecycle per class. Otherwise, those methods have to be static. Um, before each, after each test, these different variations, um, tags, extend with, all this kind of stuff can be uh, included in, in those test interfaces, so to speak. So we have um, one. I'll um, quickly show you. String tests. If I were to uh, run that, there are no test methods here. Do you see any tests? No. But it has tests. So where do they come from? Well, we can double click. They come from default methods and interfaces. So here we have a comparable contract, an equals contract, and stuff like that. So you can have reusable contracts or testing traits and implement, implement them in your test classes. That's kind of the, the point there. OK. Next up, nested test classes. So in JNF4, there were um, two runners that I know of, custom runners in the world that allowed um, support for this. Basically, it enables um, logical hierarchical grouping of your test classes um, with shared initialization state from um, outer instances. Um, and you do this by declaring at nested on a non-static uh, nested class, also known as an inner class, right? And you can even combine um, nested classes and, and test interfaces. Um, and we can see the testing uh, stack example, which is a, a cool one in the user guide as well, testing stack demo. So if we look in here, we see it makes use of um, display name, and it has this, ooh, nested class, class here, right? And then it has its own tests in there. And then, wait, oh, there's even more nesting. So what is this going to look like when we run it? It's kind of a BDD style, right? So now, if I look on this, expand all and zoom in. And we see cool stuff like that, right? So you have the very various levels there, the various test methods and the classes. And with the use of at display name, you can have custom names, have it more kind of BDD style. So that's a cool new feature as well. OK, repeated tests. You just say at repeated test, specify the number. You can have the repetition info injected if you want. Uh, override the, custom, the display name if you want. Uh, it would look something like this. I repeat it as five. Do it five times. Um, you can even change the name, as I mentioned. So if you're, here's an example in German. If you wanted to just change it to say, instead of repetition one of two, you could say, Wiederholung eins, zwei, if you speak German, something like that. So different languages, change stuff like that. Um, parameterized tests, uh, much better than what we had in JN4. So you just use at parameterized test instead of test. Specify the source of the arguments. Um, sources, we have lots of things there. Check out the, the user guide for that. So we have value source for just uh, straight values, strings, et cetera. Uh, enum source for getting enum constants. Method source, so you can actually delegate to um, a method, static method that serves as a factory for your arguments. Um, also support for CSV um, inline in the annotation, also from the file system. Or you can um, have our argument source and implement your own custom arguments provider. So for conversion, uh, impl implicit conversion for ma most basic types, enums, Java times, stuff like that. You can also have explicit conversion if you implement these APIs here. Um, parameterized test in action would look something like this. So at parameterized test, value source, a uh, list of strings here, an array. So these things are palindromes. Read them forward and backward, they work. And this test passes. It's in the, the example code, um, which I can show more tonight, or you can check out online. I have a link later. So dynamic tests. Um, this is. A
tests are normally static, right? Known in compile time and with that test, but a dynamic test is registered at runtime with a lambda expression. Um, annotating the uh, method with that test factory, uh, and we have some different ways to do that. So basically what you say is at test factory, and you return a stream of a dynamic test or a collection list, something like that. And then you just create your stream. You build it all up dynamically, however you want to, programmatically, conditionally, et cetera. Here we're saying uh, first 10 even integers. So start with zero, n equals n plus two. Get the first 10, take each number, and create a dynamic test out of that. So that's a static uh, factory from the dynamic test class. And we're giving it a name. So test n, that'd be test zero, blah, blah, blah. And then assert true, perform assertion. So you can do super dynamic stuff. You can also have containers, nested containers as well, if you want. So I will probably demo that tonight. What's missing? Um, scenario tests. We like to bring that in in one of the future releases. Ordering, you can't currently order the test methods or stuff like that. Um, no, no support yet for parallel execution within uh, the framework itself. Uh, there might be support, for example, in, in Maven Surefire, but that's outside the platform. Um, execution and user-defined thread, maybe for um, GUI-based stuff. We don't have that in yet. And uh, declarative test suites for the JNet platform. We have um, support for test suites using the JNet uh, 4 platform runner. Um, if you want to do that, but not for the, the platform itself as a generic way. And um, as I mentioned before, it's so a Java 9 module path scanning we'll be adding in soon as well. So I'm going to just briefly talk about this. Um, there's support in Spring, since Spring Framework 5.0 released. When? Who knows in the back? That guy? I'm sure he knows. Last week, <laughs> right? So um, supports all the core testing, integration testing support in Spring, um, plus support for dependency injection um, for constructors and methods. Also, super cool conditional test execution via spell expressions, so dynamic load expressions. Um, also works with Spring 4 This uh, project in my GitHub repository. <coughs> if you want to try out JN5 on Spring 4 and you're not on, on Spring 5 yet. So there's a Spring extension for that. Um, simplification with meta annotation, Spring JNIT config, and Spring JNIT web config. And then these enabled if and disabled if annotations. So I will have to show those during the BOF, I think. Just want to point out as well, um, Spring Boot also works with, with JNIT 5. So you just say at Spring Boot test and extend with the Spring annotation. So we have an example here. Please use JNIT Jupyter with Spring <coughs> and use Spring Boot test. Other stuff from Spring Boot, stuff from Spring. Create a custom annotation and then I can use it. Super short, like this. This comes from an example app I have. All that configuration, one annotation, my events controller tests, um, custom display name, auto wiring in the mock MVC that's automatically created by Spring Boot, and then using Spring mock MVC for testing. So, in closing, <coughs> lots of information on the web. Start off at uh, jd.org, check out the user guide, check out the reference manual, uh, javadoc, et cetera. Feedback uh, Gitter, GitHub, Stack Overflow, Spring resources. As I mentioned, please come tonight to the BOF. Uh, there's also another talk tomorrow more about <coughs> extensibility. And this is the uh, <coughs> demo on hmm. So that was, that was it for the whirlwind tour. Um, I'll be out afterwards for questions and also at the, the BOF tonight. So thanks for coming.